such a bright spot produced by sunlight. And that was mystified to many in science. Uh, one group led by uh, Professor Gold of Cornell University concluded that the moon's surface <coughs> was porous and would have the, con the uh, constituency of cotton or cotton candy. And the lunar module would sink into this surface and the crew would never be heard from again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was it doing Proven, being proven right portends recognition and reward. Being proven wrong is at worst embarrassing. But there are little adverse societal consequences. In any age, there are scientific controversies. That stage when the evidence is, is contradictory and the learned opinion is divided. There is no doubt many, many, there are many such divisions in today's science community, a kind of field of uncertainty that I'm sure is familiar to everyone here is atmospheric science. Ozone depletion, CO2 buildup, global warming, and climate change. Temperature and CO2 measurements today are what they are. The inferences of past conditions are somewhat uncertain, but reasonable. But predicting the future must use computer models with many independent variables. And so it is, as Shakespeare said, looking through a glass darkly. So it should not be surprising that there is so much difference of opinion on the possible effects of climate change. Now I'd like to change to the other subject of this conference, technology. Technology, applied science, and engineering. As we said earlier, most of us think of engineering as using the laws of science in the service of mankind. In short, to build new and better products and services. The Greek letter eta in the lower case is very important to engineers. It's the symbol that is most often used for efficiency. And better, in his or her view, usually means more efficient, doing an equivalent or superior job with less weight or less power or less operating cost or less capital investment. The optimist sees the glass half full, the pessimist sees the glass half empty. The engineer sees the glass as twice, being twice as big as it needs to be. <laughs> Engineers take pride in knowing that their entire existence is dedicated to doing things better. But if the engineer makes consequences, there are, if makes an error, there are consequences. Bridges may fail, fall, aircraft may crash, uh, chemical plants can explode, people can die. That provides a huge motivation to maintain high quality. Engineers rely on mathematics, so the abil ability of machines to provide high accuracy, high speed computations is essential for their performance and their, in <coughs> their, their efficiency. Uh, a breakthrough would occur in 1946 uh, when the first general purpose digital computer called the ENIAC, was put to work. It had 18,000 vacuum tubes, weighed 30 tons, and was 100 times faster than the mechanical uh, calculating machines of the time. I entered engineering college of Purdue University the following year. That was the age of the slide rule. In the Purdue Electrical Engineering Department that year, uh, Professor Lark Horowitz 
was involved, involved in analyzing those good-for-nothing substances that were not only poor electrical, electrical conductors, they were also poor insulators. He and his associates wrote a number of papers on electrical properties of germanium <clears throat> alloys and the use of electrical semiconductors. Based on Lark Horowitz's work, M.J. Kelly at Bell Laboratories authorized a substantial research project in semiconductors. There was a lot of skepticism uh, and certainly really surprise that Bell Labs would fund such a major project in the hope that something would eventually provide some sort of practical results. Even the engineers in the project called themselves the Ivory Tower Group. <laughs> but they made surprisingly rapid progress and developed a rather elegant theoretical analysis, which they called solid surface states. And the next year, based on that analysis, Walt Bratton built a device for an experiment of John Bardeen and William Schottlich. And many of you will know about that experiment. Earlier electrical devices could rectify, but this three electrode gadget could amplify. The transistor was born. The next year, John Chive's germanium wedge and Winston Koch's double dimple the coaxial transducer made solid state electronics a practical reality. So why do I mention this old history? Solid state electronics, microcircuitry, chip technology, led to high speed digital computers. And that was one of the two principal enablers of the space age. The first manned spacecraft to have an onboard computer was the two-man 1960s era Gemini, which was, therefore, the first craft that was able to navigate in space. Earlier spacecraft crews navigated by looking out the window and said, oh, that must be Australia. <laughs> <laughs> This computer did not have four gigs, it did not have four megs, it had 4K, so 4,096 yeah. words of memory. And it had application program, now apps, <laughs> <laughs> would permit guiding the rocket into orbit, rendezvousing with other spacecraft, and returning to Earth at a predetermined landing point. Gemini was the first spacecraft with propulsion that would allow it to change its orbit. Also had radar, uh, which, which helped in that ability to rendezvous with another craft, a necessary precursor to the later flights to the moon. Gemini was a wonderful little machine. I, using it, I was able to rendezvous uh, with another satellite and make the first spacecraft docking. I also set another record on that flight. In those days, we landed in the ocean by parachute. It wasn't a very elegant thing, uh, but we hoped we would, there would be a ship nearby uh, to pick us up. But with our navigation uh, and, and our guidance ability, we could steer through the, through the atmosphere and, and land at a precise point. We took great pride at landing close to where the aircraft carrier was awaiting us. My carrier was located in the Caribbean. I landed near Okinawa. <laughs> <laughs> That's the furthest anyone's ever missed. And I don't know. <laughs> the computer on the Apollo oh, okay. spacecraft and, and, uh, and the lunar flights a few years later was much more advanced. It had 36K, 36,000 words, a fixed memory constructed of woven wire rope and 2K of erasable. So. It had no 
screen, no sound, no letters, no graphics, and it weighed a bit over 32 kilos. So, so. Yet, it was far more powerful than that 30-ton ENIAC that had preceded by less than 20 years. If computers made spaceflight practical, it was the other enabler that made it possible. That enabler was the liquid fuel rocket. Solid fuel rockets had, had been around in China for a thousand years and had evolved both as fire, fireworks and as weapons. But space travel requires an engine that can be started, stopped, restarted, and throttled for various propulsive maneuvers that trajectory management dictates. Robert Goddard, the university professor who, who invented and developed the liquid propellant rocket, was a true rocket scientist. But he was, equally importantly, a rocket engineer. In over four decades of rocket research, he developed dozens of different configurations and was granted in rocketry 214 patents. The first military use of this technology was by the German Army Weapons Department, who enticed the young rocket meister, Werner von Braun, oh, yeah. of the German Rocket Society, to head their liquid rocket engineering development. And the ultimate product of that work was, of course, the Vengeance Weapon Number 2, or V2, with speeds of nearly 5,000 kilometers per hour and a range of 375 kilometers. The P-2 clearly proved that a rocket-powered, long-range strategic weapon was a valuable addition to military warfare. The P-2 included a number of, of technical concepts that had been developed by Goddard some years earlier. He, he had built uh, and tested a number of types of propellant pumps, steering vanes in the rocket exhaust, gyro stabilization, and converging, the converging diverging nozzle. Analysis of the V2 immediately after the end of the war disclosed that all of the principal technical characteristics of the V2 were nearly identical to the Goddard rocket. And there can be no doubt that the V2 was a strong stimulus for developing post-war ballistic missiles. Yeah. And we might estimate just how long such rocket boosters would have been delayed in the absence of Goddard's innovations. If the international, uh, if intermediate range ballistic missiles and the intercontinental ballistic missiles would have been delayed, it seems inevitable that the development of the very large rockets for scientific use, for commercial use, and for human spaceflight would have also been substantially delayed. And I found it personally interesting that Dr. Von Brown, in one of the strange twists of history, was the creator two decades later of the Saturn V, which launched me to the moon. There are many difficult segments of, of, uh, of a lunar voyage. The one I remember as being most challenging was the descent from the lunar orbit to the surface of the moon. There were really very many unknowns. While we knew the distance of our orbit from the center of the moon, we did not know the difference, uh, the distance of the rugged lunar surface below us to the center of the moon. And consequently, we did not know the precise altitude of our spacecraft over the lunar surface, nor did we know the altitude of our intended landing site. Without an atmosphere, typical aircraft instrumentation, such as, as the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, and the rate of climb indicator, could not be used. There are no navigation systems on the surface of the moon, no, no uh, no runways, no control towers, 
our position and